Uh, welcome everyone um, to our special board uh, board meeting tonight uh, in respect to the demographics and facility study. I'm going to turn the time over to, to John to introduce our guests and to uh, kick this off. Thank you. As, as last week when we had the ad hoc committee, it's, it's going to be the same format this week, which is we're going to hear from Fletcher Thompson and from Malona McBroom representatives, and they're going to go through the, the binders and we're going to be able to ask clarifying questions. It's not a time to talk about the different scenarios or to talk about some of the things in the book because that's going to be up to the ad hoc committee. The ad hoc committee now, for the next several months, is going to take each scenario and really look at them, look at the scenarios in depth, the pros and cons, look at the facility study for each of the buildings, and then make a recommendation ultimately to the board who will ultimately make a recommendation to the town. So tonight is just information gathering. It's just to ask clarifying questions and uh, well, there'll be other times for us to ask more specific questions as the ad hoc committee does their work. So I'd like to introduce uh, Mike Marcinick and Dan Davis from Fletcher Thompson, who will talk about the facility studies, and Allie Church from Malone and McBroom, who can talk about the demographic studies. John, thank you. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank everyone for uh, attending here tonight uh, and going through the, the, uh, all the information. Uh, this is an extensive building study and demographic study. Uh, the, uh, the both there's two parts components of this, both the uh, public uh, board of education piece as well as the town buildings. Uh, the build, extensive building evaluation took into consideration uh, life safety issues, accessibility, uh, building integrity, functionality, appearance, and energy modeling in terms of uh, where there's energy savings. Through the analysis, uh, we evaluated the deficiencies, we proposed corrective action, and estimated costs to uh, ha correct those uh, deficiencies. Tonight, we'll start with uh, Allie Church uh, of Milona McBroom to give a, a presentation on demographics. We'll move into uh, to Dan Davis from our firm to give a analysis of the different modeling from the school side to understand which schools can be uh, adjusted to uh, uh, to reflect the square footage, uh, excess square footage, and then we'll move into each one of the uh, building uh, uh, studies, town and school studies to uh, answer questions. So, Allie. Great. Thank you. Again, I'm Allie Church. I'm with the firm Mylona McBroom. I am a uh, planner and demographer in the planning department, and um, this is one of my specialties. I've been doing these for about three years, um, just general school enrollment planning. Oh, and again, so I'm going to I'm going to be presenting off this little packet here. So if, ever, if anyone hadn't gotten them, there are plenty. Um, so going through just our general um, demographic trends, um, we're eventually going to get to enrollment projections. That's kind of the ultimate goal of, of our piece. Um, and what we use to do that, we take demographics, housing, economic data, um, those three pieces being data that we can re readily find that um, people at the state do. We take census data, things like that, data that we can collect and put into our models. Um, we also do births. Um, we collect known births and then we do some projections. Um, we're doing 10 year enrollment projections here, so we'll have five years of known births and then we have to project the next five. Um, we also look at your existing enrollment trends, so how this school system's been functioning for the past 10 or so years, um, and again, leading into enrollment projections. We do those for the whole Monroe Public School System and then for each elementary school, um, and then we do move that into the architect's work and look at how that fits into a facility, into a space. Um, so this is beginning with census data. Um, keep in mind that the census is decennial, so it, it was done in 2010. It's a little outdated at this point, um, but it's good to show change. What you're seeing in the chart on the right-hand side, where there's that space between the outline and, and the solid filled area, that's where you've lost population. Um, and so for each of the cohorts, the age groupings, um, blue is male, red is female, you see you're losing in your youngest years, so basically under nine years old, and also in what would be the corresponding of their parents, um, so young um, families, 30 years to about 40. Um, and again, this is five years old at this point, and when we get into some other data sources, you'll see how this, I think this may be a little, um, a, a little different at this point. Um, there are 
two main groups that do overall population projections um, in the state of Connecticut. One of them is the Connecticut, Connecticut State Data Center at UConn. Um, theirs really heavily look at um, last 10 or 20 years of trends. Here they have a slight downward trend that they're projecting. Um, the other one that does um, population projections is the Department of Transportation. Um, their projections are done specifically to get, they're required to get federal highway monies. Therefore, they're always going to be more positive than the other ones um, because they want to see that there's more people, so we need more money. Um, we, we've put on here the continuation of the 10-year trend, um, which is the last 10 years. So that's if everything from 2000 to 2010 moved forward. That's what that green line is, which is probably, it, it's kind of an average here, but it's probably more likely of what's going to happen. Connecticut's kind of stable, so towns are either steadily growing or steadily declining. We can also look at census data um, on a census track level. Um, this doesn't, the black lines on those, that map are kind of your um, elementary school boundaries. So the, the census tracks don't completely align with the elementary schools. But you do see that um, you have a decline in population towards the south end of the town. And, and your growth has been in the north, the greens versus reds. Breaking that down, these are school age populations, so the, the census groupings are five-year-olds to 19-year-olds. That's how we can grab those um, groups. And again, red is, red is a decline and, and gr green is a um, growth. But overall in the town, you, you are growing. You were growing in those years. Um, and then, of course, we look at females of childbearing age. Those are predictors um, of future births. And again, that'll be important when we start to project births. Um, and there's been an overall loss of female and of childbearing age in, this, in the change of the census data. Looking at a completely different data source, again, we're collecting as many data points as we can from different places in order to get an overall picture uh, and kind of weed out the, the, um, the, the specifics of one data source. We don't want to rely on one because they have their, their positives and negatives of looking at things. So this is um, using real estate data. It's collected by a group called the Warren Group. Um, and these are housing sales, um, the big chunk being single family and the um, orange ones on top being condos over time. Um, and then the, the line drawn on top is that for all of Fairfield County um, on, a, on a different axis. But you can see how. Um, for a long time, um, up until the 2000s, Monroe uh, was growing at a similar, pretty steady rate at that point. It then dropped off a little earlier than the rest of Fairfield County. Um, but it's recovered better post-recession, if you can see that. It's still a little wiggly, but it's, it's kind of outpacing. I think a lot of that is that you have a strong condo market. Um, and so as people looked for cheaper options post-2008, um, uh, they, they found those here. So you actually had a little more robust housing market um, up until that point. Oh, so the, and we have preliminary 2014 numbers, sorry. Um, it's looking about 2002 sales total. Um, so it'll be about the level of last year, um, not too far off from that, which is a good sign. Um, we also use the same data source to look at housing sales. This is, again, I, I think most people could have guessed this. Um, lost down from the peak, but not substantially. And again, that, that purple line on the bottom are condos. So you do see that recovery in, con in the condo market as people look towards cheaper housing options. Um, this is another data source. This is the State Department of Economic Development collects um, annual housing permits. These are um, new housing units, not ne necessarily a new structure, but a new unit, um, and way down from your peak in the late 90s. Um, so we're, we're not in Monroe, we, and it's something that I'm sure most of you know, it's a built out community. You're not building a lot of new units. So any changeover you have in your housing stock will come from those sales. So the sales are important to look at. Um, but again, as we're any units we're adding, the, the share of students per unit is decreasing. Um, and that's partly just due to larger demographic trends where the, the family size is reducing. So you're having more singles for longer in housing units, more couples waiting to have children, and then um, also people aging in their homes. And so they're losing their grown children. And so that's another thing to, another data point to look at. 
Um, we also did some qualitative research. We um, spoke with a few members of the Board of Realtors, and this is where I think um, those early census data points that I said may have been a little delayed, where you'll see the difference here. Um, so this was just general overall, that the market here is not improving as quickly as towns in lower Fairfield County. What they saw was that um, as the entire housing market dropped, it actually became more affordable to live in lower Fairfield County for a lot of families. And so they took that chance and moved, um, and moved south and closer to their jobs. Um, and so those houses that are over $500,000 are not selling as quickly because they can find comparable things in lower Fairfield County. What is moving here are starter homes. Um, a good sign for those starter homes is that there's, they're most interested in three, at least three bedrooms, meaning that people are, um, even if they don't have children now, are thinking that you know it's, that's not just one guest room that you know to us says you may have children. Um, and so it's younger families kind of looking for a deal finding that in Monroe, um, and they also think that there's very good schools, so they're looking in and maybe thinking of the future, so on par with Trumbull, Monroe, and Newtown. Um, and always interesting for us when we have to think about a possibility of closing elementary schools, there is no strong real estate preference for one elementary school or another. They all have um, equal footing on that point. Um, this is, unemployment is only really, really useful for us if it, um, is very different from other averages. You see here it really strongly aligns with the state of Connecticut, um, although of course you're a couple percentage points below the state of Connecticut on, on average. Um, unemployment is odd in this sense, it seems odd, but it is a very good predictor of births. People have um, more children when the economy is better and when unemployment is lower. And so that's why we always keep it in our studies and we use it to do birth projections. So moving into births, um, we collect births, the birth data from the um, Connecticut Department of Health. They um, all births that are recorded to a resident mother in Monroe will eventually be recorded um, by the state. Um, and so we get them for a good amount of years back. In this case, we got 1996. And I think that's really good to see here. You can see how you had in the late 90s, you averaged about 250 births uh, per year. You dropped in the mid-2000s to about 200. And now we're looking at, at about 150, and that's where we've been. Um, we do have preliminary data for 2012 and 2013. But what happens with the, the births reported to the state is they get Connecticut births first, obviously. But it takes up to two years to get out of state births. Um, and, and New York, unfortunately, is notoriously slow for getting it. So they're, it's always preliminary until they've gotten those New York state births. Um, and so those two numbers at the bottom there, the, the 2012 and 2013, are expected to increase slightly. Um, and that's why we haven't grouped them in yet. Um, and, and we do keep that in mind. And the way that actually we get the data is by address points. And so that allows us to map all of the births and see if there's, again, a strong preference for one area or one part of town. Um, and they're pretty well distributed, though, in Monroe. Um, you can see the chart on the upper left and then the map here. Um, again, we're doing 10-year projections, and so um, the births that we have this year in 2014 will inform the incoming cl kindergarten class of 2019, um, but then that requires us to project an additional five years of births. Um, we do several models um, for projecting births, and then we kind of see how they play out, and that's what you see here on the right. Um, we've done a, a regression analysis, which is, um, is based on economics and housing data. Um, and for that, we, we actually do three separate set of assumptions. So we do a low growth model, a medium growth model, and a high growth model. And then we project the births in, in that range. Um, and then we also use um, state and national fertility rates. And we um, average that out by based on population projections per um, so fertility rates come in cohort groups. So we have a specific fertility rate that you can see there for women who are 15 to 19 years. And then we, we multiply that by population projections. And so we try to get that out. And those um, are really just used to make sure that our regressions are on par with other people's data. Because again, we're using other people's population projections. We're using those Connecticut data center numbers. And so what that results in is a chart that looks sort of like this. And the, again, the demographic models confirmed um, the low to mid economic based regression analysis. And actually, I'm going to go back for one, just to show you this assumptions one more time. Um, 
the low growth assumption assumes that um, every all the economic and housing uh, conditions we have now will continue for the next 10 years, so basically no improvement. Um, the high growth model um, assumes that the best time we had in the last 15 years, we're going to gradually get back up to that over 10 years. And the medium growth is kind of based in the middle, but steady growth that we've had in the last few years will continue upward. Um, and again, so we found that the, the we were a little low, but the medium was the best um, project predictor here. So continued growth like you've seen in the last couple years. This is just, again, how they look together. Um, and we're going to continue, most importantly, in that 150 range. We Some of the models have us going slightly out of it, and we're also not going well below that. But that 150 births per year seems to be um, what will continue. So then moving forward to your data, um, these are the students that have been in your system. They're in your system now. Um, we just model these in different ways, plot them in different ways to look at the declines. Um, in the upper left, you'll see the K to, K to 12, and that kind of looks a little steep and scary. But if you look over to the K to 5th, you'll see that that's actually kind of bottoming out at this point. So the decline in your younger years, is you've had it for a few years, and it's kind of starting to stabilize. Um, the middle school is kind of the steepest, and the lower left, um, that's in the midst of its main decline. And the high school actually really hasn't felt a lot of the decline yet, so that's still coming um, overall. And looking, that, looking at that in a different way, this is each year for each uh, grade. And um, as we progress, you'll see that, again, I've broken that up into those same colors, the green being those years that had an average of 250 births. Uh, the yellow, an average of 200 births. And then we have just started this average of 150 births. And so those cohorts have yet to move through the system, really. Your high school is still, your high school population is still, um, was birth years of about 250 students. Um, and just what's circled there, um, and these will pop up. Um, what's circled there, you only have two years of full-day kindergarten, so keep that in mind. Um, those, those numbers, you can see the birth decay on those is much higher because those were the years when you started that program, and so you had more um, move into the system. Again, we also like to look at them um, school by school. Um, not a lot you know, of variation, but Monroe L has been overall the most stable, and uh, Fawn Hollow is seen the most decline at this point. Just one other data source that we get from the state is, um, just to keep this in mind, you lose about 300 students um, overall system-wide to private schools and about 50 to other public schools. Um, as with other parts of the state, um, you are losing slightly more of your students um, in the past couple years to other public schools as these big magnet systems are coming online. Um, so you see that high school share has really increased the last year. Um, and that's to be expected. That's, you know, a result of things we know. But So those are the known um, data points. We're going to move now into the enrollment projection. So taking all of the data that I've just presented, um, we do this um, what we call a cohort survival methodology. Um, and cohort survival is the st standard uh, enrollment projection model. It's required if you do any, um, if you apply for a grant for any um, construction from the state, you have to show at least eight years projections for, um, using cohort survival method. Um, and it really needs a, a strong data set from the recent past. So that's why we, again, pull all this data up to this point. Um, cohort survival means you take each cohort, so you take your births, and you model how many of them survive, which is a little morbid, but how many of those births survive into your kindergarten program, and then therefore kindergarten to first, and so on and so on. So it's the, the survival of the cohorts. Um, and what that looks like is something called a persistency ratio. So this is a similar table to the last one, but if you look along the top, um, and we'll do that first column, birth to K. So these are how many of the births that were attributed to Monroe mothers <laughs> arrived in your kindergarten system. And you'll see that the numbers almost entirely are over one. That means that more, you had less births than you had kindergartners. So you're gaining, if you're over one, that means you're gaining students into um, your system. Um, of course, the anomaly there will be 
2012, 2013. And I mean, anyone can guess that that's because parents were just holding their kids back to get into full day K. They just held off, and that's why it was a big jump the next year. Um, so if you were on the cusp, you said, I'm going to hold off and, and go with the full day K program. Um, another thing that we often see are eight to nine. The eight to nine cohorts always generally low because that's when you'll lose the majority of your students to private or parochial schools. Um, and we do different averages at the bottom. That's how um, we go through this model. Eventually, one of those gets picked, and we use that to, to do your population projections. So again, um, we just to reiterate the birth assumptions, we did three sets of birth models, um, the low, medium, and high growth rates. And that led us to this, this um, the low, medium, and high enrollment projections. Again, that um, decline continues for at least three or four more years. And then in the two high, in the medium and the high model, it really starts to just bottom out and plateau. Um, and the low projections, it takes a few more years to get to that. I'll, I'll just go through the low projections, and then you can flip through on your own to the other ones. Um, but again, the, the low projection at the bottom, it assumes little to no economic growth or housing market recovery. So this is not what we expect to happen. It's just good to have them in here. Um, a caveat I actually didn't say earlier is when we leave and you're all looking this over in a year or two years, if one of these, ha if something happens wildly, if you get a new housing development that opens 500 units, you have the, the data in here, and you can say, we need to look at that high model. Um, even though we'll continue to look at the medium for our process here, you have those here at, at your disposal to use. Um, so looking at the change in the lowest one, um, the table is year by year at the top. And then we've, we've summed them in, in the first five-year segment, the second five-year segment, and then the overall 10-year change. So even at the lowest model, you're seeing that the K to fifth grade um, in the second five years actually starts to grow, that slight, slight increase there, um, while your biggest declines will happen again in high school because they've yet to hit those declines from the, the lower birth cohorts. Um, so similar chart, this is the medium town-wide projection. Again, assumes current upward trends continue and the, um, the high town-wide town trends that returns Monroe to its peak housing and economic environments. Um, and then again, we, as I previously said, believe that the medium was probably the most um, likely going forward. And so this is just kind of what it looks like um, in a visual sense. You see, again, those blue on the bottom actually starts to grow um, back up to around the level you have now. So you'll lose for the next couple years and then get back up to about the same amount of students that you have in the system now. We're getting towards the end, I promise. Um, so we're, we also, again, did the school by school. Um, this is important when we start to align our work with the architects. We need to see not just how many first graders you're going to have overall, but are, are they going to be skewed towards one side of town or the other? Um, and so it's a little hard to see on the screen, but um, a very similar trend. And it's actually very um, even um, overall. You'll see that. Um, it changes slightly, but you can. it's actually more useful if we keep going to the utilization. And I'll, I'll go quickly to that. Um, so utilization um, is really where our work ties into the architect's work. Um, we did a, a classroom analysis. Um, so the architects went to every single school in the system, um, as you can see from your giant binders. Um, and they, what they provided us is um, on the upper right uh, without the color. Um, and so they provided us, and you really can't see it here, but you can, there's a fold out in your books of each of the floor plans. And what they've annotated on it is the square footage and then the use of it. So they all say something like 623 square feet, a classroom for third grade. And when I went through with the, my highlighter, and I classify each of those. Um, so I count which are full-size classrooms. And then of the full-size classrooms, what's an instructional room, so a kindergarten, first, second, et cetera. What's an art room, a music room, a kind of a special programming? What's a resource room? And what's a special, a special education room? Um, and then we develop off of that a, a um, current deploy, a functional capacity model. And that's based on the current deployment of programming that you have. 
Um, so we say you're going to continue having the same amount of special ed. You're going to have the same amount of art everywhere. Um, we're going to continue that going forward. And we're going to use these um, class size maximums. So for pre-K, it's 20 students in the classroom. K through 4, it's, okay, well, I guess it's K through 8, really. It's 25. And then for the high school, it's, it's 28. And those are the maximums, the not to exceed. So my model drops you down to another, you need another room if you have 26 students. Um, and again, we use those medium um, projections by school to see what that would look like. And so there's just a blow up of the floor plan. And um, so again, this is kind of what our classroom analysis chart looks like. Um, so for uh, Fawn Hollow, which I have here, you can see, um, let me see if I can get this laser pointer to work. So I want to do a quick thing about full-size classrooms. Um, a full-size classroom does not um, does not say that you don't have programming if there's not a, a full-size classroom devoted for it. And the, the best example I can give you is right here, there's a little OTPT room. Um, it's not big enough to count as a full-size classroom for us. That's not to say you don't have full programming in OTPT, even though it doesn't show up on this chart on the next page. Um, it's just saying that if you cleared everything out and started from scratch, we couldn't put, we could not fit a full first grade or second grade class in there. And so that's what this here is. These full-size classrooms are only those full-size, generally larger than 700 square foot rooms in each of the schools. We've, again, broken those up into instructional classrooms. Um, and actually, did I? No, I did. Um, instructional classrooms, other full-size classrooms, which are all other programming. Any pre-K classrooms, because we're dividing those out and counting those separately. Um, and then anything that's used as a staff office or something. Um, Ellie, Ellie, one question. Yep. Uh, we, uh, we corrected the error before Did in Rowell. Mm -hmm. And that, that looks correct now based on the, the correct number of full-size rooms. But then the data to the right of that hasn't changed. So I'm wondering if there's a mathematical error in there or not. The data to the OK. Yeah, it looks the same as the last one. I just want to make sure whatever, you know, that it's accurate throughout. So I think that's something that just yeah, I'll, double check. Yeah, I'll, I'll confirm that with okay. you. So um, and just to go into that, so Monroe L, if anyone's ever been in there, there are four classrooms that are used as full-size classrooms that are between 100, or 600 and 623 square feet, um, which is smaller than our, our limit. We were using 700 square feet as the limit for a full-size classroom. Um, two of those are used for special programming, and so we left those out of our analysis. But two currently have, and I believe it says on here, a fourth and a fifth grade classroom in them. Because they're counting we're counting the students as well, we needed to keep those in for our analysis. And so there are, and it's footnoted here, these four classrooms that we need to kind of decide. And that's what Jack was alluding to. We dropped this down to, to remove two of them. And I, I need to confirm that um, yeah, if you could just everything. Check it. Yep. Um, because then what we do on the side is we take uh, the um, instructional classrooms that we have here and we multiply um, uh, we multiply that by our again our class size loading and we say as a functional capacity if you were filled to capacity how many students could you have in the in Fawn Hollow for example and, and we're saying 625 um, and you currently have 512 and that gives you um, an 81, 82% um, utilization. Um, and although that seems low, um, if you look overall, a system <coughs> wants to function between 80 and 85%. Um, and so overall, although you have some low, what, what seem low and some which seem high, what you have is the flexibility in your system. And, and again, that's a, a general standard overall for school systems is 80 to 85% efficiency. If something happens and you have a big birth bubble that you weren't expecting, you have the flexibility to move classrooms around, to move programming where it needs to be. Um, anything higher than, you know, much higher than that, you, you don't have that flexibility. And uh, of course, below that, you don't have the, um, the it gets too expensive. So. That's the analysis here. And then finally, um, and I'll just go through one of these, but you have them for all schools, for all grades. I'll just go through this one set. We've tied those, pop, those enrollment projections back into this classroom analysis. And so you see, um, again, at Fawn Hollow, we're projecting in 1516, 61 kindergartners. And using your class size maximums, that will require three classrooms. And so as you move across, 
you have 39 <laughs> classrooms available in 1516 or in all years. Um, and this will give you, um, you, you will re be required, sorry, um, it, it'll require 23 classrooms and that'll allow 16 extra classrooms to be left for programming and resourcing um, that you have now. And making the average class size 21. So although those, those class size maximums seem a little high, overall what's happening is that um, you're about 21 students. And again, we've done these for multiple years, and I just have some samples here, and for each of the schools. Um, one final note, the STEM system, the middle school STEM system, has been broken out separately. Um, it's basically a school without a building, so it doesn't have the square footage, but you can see how many, what would be required there. And for those that have seen this before, we've actually upped, this is another change that we've made, we've upped um, that to 75 students per grade. Um, it was 60 on the last presentation. So now that we have the projections, I'll hand it over to the architects cool. and you can go through the, the options. Right. Allie had 45, 44 <laughs> slides, uh, and basically uh, we only have two. My name is Dan Davis. I'm an architect with Fletcher Thompson. I've spent a lot of time uh, working on school K-12 projects. Uh, we started our analysis uh, with the state reimbursable square footage uh, numbers. They're in the notebook, and based on the age of the student, uh, the grade level as they move through, and the size of the school, those numbers vary. Uh, the state reimbursable square footage is the number the, uh, the state uses to reimburse the school systems when they build new schools. Uh, it doesn't mean that that's how large they think your school should be. It is just what they're saying. They're your partner up until that point. In our analysis, most schools in the state build about 10% more square footage than the state reimbursable square footage. Uh, and that's uh, uh, proven if you take a look at your existing school system right now. Maybe I can go to the next slide that has the summary. Or maybe, I don't know, it's, you might have to open your books. I mean, I'm not sure if you can see the numbers on the screen. Uh, but if you work your way down the list and taking all the schools within the system, uh, you know, there's 475 students at Fawn Hollow. That puts it about 10% above the state reimbursable square footage. Uh, at Monroe Elementary, about 14% above the state reimbursable square footage. Step me, you're a little closer, about 5% over the state reimbursable square footage. Chalk Hill is not included in this calculation. It's used by another school system. Uh, so in our point of view, it's, it's empty from Monroe's uh, analysis. Jockey Hollow exists around 12% above the state reimbursable square footage. And um, Massac High School, with the STEM students from the 6th, 7th, and 8th grades, uh, is operating about 9% above the state reimbursable square footage. So you're doing all the right things. If your enrollment projections were to move forward just as they are now, you made some very good choices to distribute your grade level students across the different schools in a very, uh, in a very good way that you're right around that 10% and collectively and on the individual schools. But unfortunately, your enrollment projections are going down. So we have proposed 13 different options. And I know some of the options are going to be more popular than others, or maybe all of them are unpopular. But the very first option is doing nothing at all. If you were just to leave the schools the way it is now, uh, you would have 14% above the state reimbursable square footage at Fawn Hollow, 17% at Monroe, 5% at Stepney, 100% at Chalk Hill, 31% above the state reimbursable square footage at, Chalk, at Jockey Hollow, and 23% above the state reimbursable square footage at Massac High School. Okay, so the uh, numbers have changed. So that proves that doing nothing, real, re, nothing is really not an option. You have to figure out a way to distribute your school age population amongst the buildings you have. And my very last slide in the bottom and the conclusion, I say, you're actually in very good shape. You have a lot of options. Uh, so you have a lot of choices to make uh, with how you distribute the students among, along the schools. Uh, but by just closing Chalk Hill and leaving the grade school population the way it is now puts you at 26% above the state reimbursable square footage, uh, which means you have about 16% excess square footage in the system. 
Uh, and that might be an option. You might say, you know, we want to move ahead with that in place, but I think you could be more efficient uh, with your system. Uh, so then we move, and there's all the different background information across the charts. We have, we've picked, I should have started with this. Year one is next year. Year eight in the system is year 2022, 2023. Uh, the eight is a magic number with the state. They want you to go eight, out eight years uh, when you're planning a new school or when you're reassessing the school system as you are. It's a magic number in some of Ali's analysis as well. So those are the columns A1, A8? Yes. So you'll see on the top, A has two different schemes, A in year one and then A in year eight. Uh, and then we move our way through the system. Uh, let me move to the next slide because it has all the, the numbers are a little bit larger in this case. Uh, you'll see uh, the system has a variation between 26% above the state reimbursable square footage. A few of them come in at 10. Uh, this last one comes in at 8. I'll go back to the previous slide. So you can distribute the grade population only as efficiently as, as you can, uh, but you want to hover around the 10% when you're all said and done. Okay? So uh, we are proposing that uh, 13 different options, if you can consider A8 as one of the options. Uh, we have some schools being closed two times, others being closed seven times, some three. There's a lot of variation, but you'll never see us suggesting a closure at the high school. Uh, while you can take elementary stu uh, school students and maybe move them to a middle school or move middle school students to an elementary school with some adjustments, you know, make that work. The facilities here at the high school are excellent, and to recreate that at another school and move high school students to another school really doesn't make much sense to us. Uh, it's a matter of maybe moving other students into the high school, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade students maybe into this building, reconfiguring how you might use it to create the isolation and the separation that would make that work. Uh, but we don't. We never propose closing the high school and all these options. It's the largest school in the system and uh, it really serves the community very nicely the way it is now. Why not bring more students here as a, you know, we're not suggesting you knock down parts of it either. Okay, so uh, we have, and you can look in the, the information in, in, the, in the booklets, uh, we have different grade configurations in the scheme number B, we're suggesting can you solve the problem with, by closing just one elementary school and leaving the students in the middle school and high school where they are now and just dividing the students from the school that's closed amongst the other two elementary schools. And then that you'll see that there's not enough square footage in the two elementary schools to handle moving those students to those different uh, schools. So that meant to us that we have to be a little bit more creative. This is not an easy fix by just closing the doors on one building and moving those kids to other places. So we get more and more creative as, as we move from left to right within these different scenarios. Uh, the last one suggests even closing three schools and creating, uh, bringing Jockey, uh, Chalk Hill online for the early learners, uh, 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 Jockey Hollow for the middle learners, and then the high school for the upper grades. And that almost begins to work. You're around 8% above the state reimbursable square footage. Uh, so we're suggesting all different kinds of options, and I know some of these may be more popular than others. Don't shoot the messenger. We're just trying to really put everything out there that we thought made some sense. Some of them make maybe more sense from a, a pedagogy point of view. Others might make more sense from uh, the culture of the community and, and the fondness for uh, the way the schools are being organized right now. Uh, there's lots of different ways to sort this. But in the end, please keep in mind that you have a lot of different options. Uh, and then you, know, you can go shopping and have a lot of discussion. But if you take the bottom chart and sort of take these numbers across, you have about 200, uh, exactly, 2,810 students in your system. And right now you have about 635,000 square feet. You only need around 430,000 square feet. All the different scenarios are sort of bounce around that number. So plus or minus a few thousand uh, square feet, you're in around the 430,000 square feet range. That means you have 205,000 more square footage than the state reimbursable square footage. Uh, and you probably want to be Again, uh, about that 10% sort of range, that means you're on about 45,000 square feet uh, for that to, to, to happen. That means you need to take 160,000 square feet offline and either mothball the school like you did at Chalk, uh, uh, Chalk Hill 
or to repurpose it maybe for another use. There's a, the chart down at the bottom talks about all the different options you have at your disposable, mm -hmm. at disposal, moving parks and rec, creating another library, another senior center, uh, moving st uh, town offices into these buildings. And depending on where the excess square footage is, different options might make more sense. But a, you know, a community center or those kinds of things. So it doesn't mean that you're taking, you know, you're demolishing any square footage, you're just repurposing it for serve the town in a different capacity than, than it has been up till now as a school. Uh, the school buildings are all in very good shape. Even Chalk Hill, I know it was mothballed uh, and then brought back to life. Uh, but it is a very solid building and I think has to be considered as a, in, in the scenarios as something that, that could come back online. Depending on how you reposition the students, uh, it's very hard to put early learners in the uh, Jockey Hollow School because uh, early learners need to be on the level of ed exit discharge. They need to be on ground level so they can get directly out of the building without having to be in a fire stair and maybe overrun by older students. So they would have to be able to get right out of the building. And because of the multi-floor arrangement and the fact there are very few classrooms on that lower level, uh, it doesn't make it a good home for uh, some of the elementary school models. Where Chalk Hill might be a better home for an elementary school than, uh, than Jockey Hollow would have been. So that's why we're putting it back in the mix. Dan, could you just explain a little bit about Chalk Hill and the egress and how that, that could work there? OK. Uh, if you put on the ground level of the building uh, all the spaces that kindergartners and first graders, and even maybe you want to expand that to second graders use on that bottom level, and to move third, fourth, and fifth graders up to the floor above, uh, that school will work fine as an elementary school. You can't have any spaces that uh, pre-K, K, and 1 use on an upper level of the building. They have to go into a fire stair to find their way out of the building. They have to be on the exit and discharge the level. Is the cafeteria an issue? We're well? proposing uh, repurposing another space on the lower level to bring the cafeteria down to that level. Okay, so that's the way that we'd make that so work. So to make that happen, there would be construction. There'd be some construction uh, that would have to take place. A lot of the schools have uh, pre-K and K eating in the classroom and not in the cafeteria. So it might not be an issue for those learners. But your first graders, you can't have them go up to the second floor. Uh, and then if there was ever an emergency, they'd have to use the fire stair. We've done it in some urban schools where we put dedicated staircases within the building. We did it in Torrington and some other places years ago. So you can work with the state. Uh, they just want to make sure everyone is safe. So there might be other ways that we could, with some modifications, make the, uh, those students safe uh, within the building. So if that scenario uh, gets serious consideration, we can go further down that road to show you how that might happen. So. So in the end, uh, you have some, some tough choices to make, but you also are blessed with a lot of different options. And we stopped at 13. Uh, and if there's another scenario, once you sort of really get into this, that you think needs some more consideration, please let us know. We'd be happy to consider other options. But we thought this sort of covered uh, different distributions. We have, you know, you know, uh, pre-K and K uh, dedicated schools and some of the options. We have some uh, options that have students changing grades, changing schools very often, uh, which is something that a lot of educators don't like. Uh, we have some other, you know, more neighborhood, you know, options within the system. So uh, I think, you know, this really does cover many of the things you might want to consider. Uh, but again, if something else comes to light, we'd be happy to, to give it the attention it deserves. So. And so this is just the beginning of the work of the ad hoc. The ad hoc committee yes. now will take these different scenarios and probably come up with scenarios on their own and go each one specifically looking at the, the, the building needs, which you're going to go over next, mm. and then uh, deciding what works and make some recommendations. So the work has just begun, really, for the ad hoc committee. Okay. And it, it, it will be a very interesting discussion, uh, and I'm sure you know, there will be other options that will come to light as part of that discussion. Thank you. Okay, we'll go on to uh, the building assessments um, in section four of the black books, uh, and the basically the blue books are all this this section are the written analysis and pictures of all the deficiencies and issues relative to the buildings. Um, so you can read through that; it, it's pretty thorough. It, it, so it give you a write up of where the deficiencies are and a picture that shows what what the issue is. 
if you go, and, and there's a floor plan with each one of these uh, buildings, each one of the schools. If you go to section five, um, section five is really where the critical uh, components are, are detailed out in terms of cost structure and what they are relative to their um, the classification, whether it's life safety, accessibility, building integrity. Um, the first page in that will give you a list of the building numbers. So in the case of the schools, we've listed them one through five as the current schools that are being operated by uh, the town of Monroe. Uh, building one being Monroe L, and then 24 was Chalk Hill because that was out of the out of the original school mix. If you take the next page, it gives you the deficiency category. Uh, category one being fire life safety, two building building code uh, compliance, et cetera, et cetera. So that gets you, and then we give a matrix of what we mean by that, uh, what the priority is. Uh, items that are uh, priority one, those are critical issues that need to be taken care of. Once we identify a critical issue that's either life safety or accessibility, it really should be addressed because now that responsibility is on you to make sure it gets corrected, okay? And then in, you'll see on, uh, uh, there's a, a large page that, that defines how the matrix works. The first number of the matrix is the school, uh, school building or town building. Um, this built, this one right here. The A being the category of either architecture or engineering, whether it's mechanical, electrical, structural, or fire protection. Uh, the one being the category of the uh, deficiency, the uh, uh, life safety or accessibility or appearance, functionality, and the O1 is the item number related to that deficiency. So when you go through this matrix, you'll see we've identified the uh, deficiencies, we've uh, given you a, a priority, we've given you a pr uh, proposed corrective action, and we've estimated the cost to fix that. So you can go through that at your leisure and decide how the town wants to address it. Uh, at the last meeting with the ad hoc committee, we did talk to them about two issues that we thought were pretty important at the uh, town uh, senior center. Um, so, and we were able to have them understand, um, you know, the real cost structure. And just to give you an example, if you look at page two of the Monroe Elementary analysis, and that would be line item 1A1.16, talks about life safety, flame resistant finishes. Do your stage curtains, uh, appear to have a lack of flame resistant fabric label. We don't know that, okay? It may be flame resistant. We can't tell that because there's no label on there. So absent of a label, we're gonna say replace. But if you can tell us when you replace them that they are flame retardant, then that should be labeled. So there are ways to get around certain issues. And with that, I think we'll leave it uh, open for uh, questions. Is there any ability to go further than that? So, um, in general, the projections, and this is just a caveat before I will answer the question, but in general, those first five years of projections are very, very good. We have the known births, they're very good. The farther we have to project births, the, the less dependable the projections be, and that's generally why we stop at 10 years. Um, you're only required to have the eight for the state. Um, we could, and the Connecticut Data Center, again, does do their general population projections farther out. But what happens is the, um, if you start to get in a loop where the projections are kind of linear, and so you just start to get a linear progression after a while. And so they're just not as good after 10 years. But yeah, um, we, we generally suggest you come back to your projections after those first five years, and we add another five on. Just one last comment. Uh, this is a draft report. It's not a final. We would hope that everyone can take a look and read through this. Give us, a, give us your comments. Let's allow us to answer those issues. Uh, and then once we have all the information, we will put together a final report. 
give it to the town, electronic format, uh, so that it can get posted on the website, so that anyone has accessibility to it. Um, the ad hoc facilities committee will take this going forward and do more work. What's the timeline in terms of what they will do next and when we'll hear? Uh, our next our meeting is in, in February. Um, and so the first thing that we're going to do is talk about how we're going to take each of these scenarios and T-chart it with the pros and the cons and also using the facilities because some of these you know, is it cost effective to open back up Chalk Hill? Is it not cost effective? So we're going to look at all of those kinds of things too as we go through this. So it will be through probably through the summer before we have a, a real good handle on where we want to go with this. And then we'll hear a recommendation report. Hear recommendation reports, and again, it'll be based on not just what the numbers say, but you know, what what the you know what the configuration is. Is it appropriate for configuration for school? Um, you know, too many transitions, things like that. Will those recommendations be narrowed down to one option, or will you present more than one option? Um, we haven't really talked about it yet, but I, I gather we will present more than one option, so there will be discussions about that. Okay. In light of the study, would redistricting be an option? I, mean, I, I would say for some of these, you would have to. Um, would be my response. You couldn't necessarily close two elementary schools and not redistrict, um, but I, I think it would be up to the group. Yeah, right? so and I think you saw that the births are pretty scattered within <laughs> the three districts anyway, so um, if we close an elementary school, then yes, I think we'd have to redistrict, but if we didn't, we could. Well, option, option B it sort of tries to do that a little bit by redistricting the elementary school students, and it just doesn't work. It's, it's a more complex solution uh, really needs to, you know, to be considered. You, you can't see it, but if you go to option B, uh, when you close Monroe L and you try to redistrict and you go and add students to Fawn Hollow, that creates the, uh, the opposite effect where you have to now add space, which you don't want to do. You've listed a ton of deficiencies at each building. How do they fall into the plan? Who looks at that? And who's going to make recommendations on what really needs to be done? Well, it's up to the uh, ad hoc committee that's got to look at that. With the, uh, I think each of the either the town bill, uh, budget or the school budget to understand how they're going to fix the deficiencies. And, and Mark, just to let you know, too, part of the uh, board's strategic plan includes the fact that we're waiting on this report to help design future budgeting and future capital planning. Questions from the public, town officials? Yes. I was wondering if, um, you know, in the scenarios where you're closing schools and things like that, is busing costs uh, considered in any of At this time, it wasn't. And that's something that we're going to have to look at, um, and we talked about that. We're going to have to look at what it what it means. Does it save? Is it more cost to do the busing? So that's something that we're going to have to do in the ad hoc, and it'll probably be a charge that the ad hoc does to the administration because we'll have to get the information for the ad hoc committee. Okay. And I have one question: Did this feasibility study, if we did all open up Chalk Hill? These, are these numbers here, all the numbers, or to get us to, let's say, a like new status for that building, or no, that would be a totally different study? Correct, correct. There was a study that was done. Yeah, we're gonna update the closure study. Uh, we have the document, and it's in the back of the, uh, the, the revised budget to close Truck Hill is in here. Uh, but to go to a like new status, no, that's not included. I need a motion to adjourn. A second. All in favor? All in favor. And we're adjourned. I need to be clear on it.